It's Monday, June 19. In the headlines, newly appointed Senator Apka Fitzhenley opens State of the Nation debate. In business news, this week's Young Boss is all about providing you with amazing concrete services. He is Yannick Sharp. Regionally, Barbados supports creation of global coalition for social justice. Internationally, U.S. Secretary of State held candid, substantive and constructive talks with Chinese Foreign Minister. And in sports, we talk about the redevelopment of the Independence Park Complex. This is the news on PBC Jamaica. I'm Simone Absalom Gale. Senator Apka Fitzhenley says the Jamaican economy has been so well managed by the wholeness administration that has presided over eight consecutive quarters of positive expansion without having levied any new taxes on the people for eight consecutive years. Despite the economy being skillfully navigated to reasonably safe waters, the Jamaican people can be assured that the government of Prime Minister Andrew Holness is seized of the fact that there is a crucial need for more of the Jamaican masses to benefit directly from gains being made as the economy continues to expand. He also noted the government's increase in social benefits. But there are already signs that this administration is aware of difficulties being faced by sections of the masses and we're taking steps to address them. Among those indicators are the fact that effective this month, the national minimum wage will be increased from nine to thirteen thousand dollars per week. That comes into effect this month. The largest increase. The largest increase sanctioned by this administration. That's the largest in two decades. Senator Fitzhenley also made note of the 137 houses handed out to families in need under the Prime Minister's new social housing program. I'm pleased to advise this parliament that over 520 Jamaicans across 48 constituencies have so far benefited from the program. The program does not discriminate based on who is the MP for the area or the political persuasion of anybody. And this is a very important program geared towards delivering shelter to those in need. And I urge members of the private sector to join forces with the government with a view of doubling the output from the program. Noting that the nation's economy grew in the January to March quarter of this year by 2.7% when compared to a similar phase last year, is an indication that they're heading into the right direction. He says the administration will continue to work hard and explore policies to make Jamaicans' lives better, even as we seek to build on having achieved record quarterly expansion in the economy. Senator Fitzhenley made the comment while opening this year's State of the Nation debate in the Senate. It was also his maiden address in the Upper House after his recent appointment in May. Pensioners are now being paid new pension rates under the National Insurance Scheme. It's their first increase in five years. The Ministry of Labor and Social Security had previously indicated that payment of the new rates, which became effective on April 1, 2023, would be delivered on a phased basis, starting mid-June 2023. Portfolio Minister Pernell Charles Jr. says pensioners who are paid by pension order books would receive the new rates next month when their new books are due. The first pension order voucher in the new book will reflect the arrears as well as the month's payment at the new rate. Minister Charles explained that the benefit for persons in receipt of full-rate pensions has increased by 23%, moving from $3,400 to $4,200 per week. For persons receiving the three-quarter rate, the benefit has increased by 37% and moves from $2,550 per week to $3,500 per week. Persons receiving the half-rate pensions will see a 76% increase, moving from $1,700 per week to $3,000 per week.
Jinan Panton, who is accused of defrauding millions of dollars from Stocks and Securities Limited, SSL, was remanded in custody for another six months to allow investigators more time for the submission of crucial files related to the major fraud at SSL. Justice Vinette Graham Allen ordered Ms. Panton to make her next appearance on December 6, 2023. Ms. Panton is accused of fleecing roughly $3 billion from more than 30 SSL clients over a 10-year period. The former SSL wealth advisor was indicted for three counts of larceny as a servant, three counts of falsification of accounts, five counts of forgery, five counts of altering forged documents, three counts of engaging in transaction involving stolen property, and three counts of breaches of the Cyber Crimes Act. Time now for the business report with Danita Rodney. Welcome to the business report. I'm Danita Rodney. Are you looking to give your home or business a unique finished look? With this week's young boss, Yannick Sharp, CEO of Amazing Concrete, that is his area of specialization. Hi, I'm Yannick Sharp, Managing Director of Amazing Concrete Finishes Group Limited. So essentially, Amazing Concrete Finishes is a decorative concrete company. We provide um, decorative solutions in terms of stamp concrete, epoxies, textured concrete, stained concrete, polished concrete, artificial rocks, and now we also provide ready mix concrete solutions. So essentially, once you have a concrete surface, we can beautify it and, and enhance it the way you want it make it look amazing. Essentially, I started out doing navigation. I went to Maritime Institute, went on the sea, did my sea time, didn't like it. Came back to Jamaica, um, started working with my family's construction company. And while working there, my mother had saw decorative concrete online showed it to me, asked me what I think about it, given that I'm in the construction industry, if I think it could work. Um, we looked into it, went overseas, did some training, came back and started the company in 2011. I would say the finishes that we provide, the customer service and the standard that we provide to our clients. Um, once they have an idea, we can bring it to life. Depends on the finish, the surface, the vision, or the space. Once you have a vision that you would like to execute, we can bring it to life. Well, when I first started Amazing Concrete, I can give you an example. We started off with first year doing 300,000 in revenue and now we're upwards of a hundred million dollars in revenue so that can give it a growth trajectory of the company over the past 12 years all right before i started at 21 nobody wanted to give a 21 year old a million dollar job because they say i'm going to floss it off or party it off but over the years you gain experience and um, you become recognized in the industry and people have more confidence given that the jobs that we have executed over the years. My goal is to employ at least a thousand people by 2025. So I like to be able to provide for people, be able to, for them to provide for their families. Because if you don't try to help the society, see where Jamaica is going now. Recently I started sponsoring a lot of um, youth sports activities. We just sponsored the Mona Prep Track and Field, which is my alma mater. Um, we sponsored Tornado Swim Championship. 
I just try and tell the youths because in my opinion, from age four to age 18 is where you have to get them. After 18, it's very hard to bring them back. So I would say that is my contribution to society. Have confidence in yourself. That is the most important thing because there are going to be days where you're down and you get rejected, but you just have to keep persevering. For your market updates in foreign exchange trading for Friday, June 16, the US dollar sold for an average of $155.12, the Canadian dollar ended trading at $117.44. The pound sterling traded for $199.61 and the euro sold for an average of $172.07. In GSE trading, the GSE index declined by 843 points. The junior market index advanced by 44 points. The combined market index declined by 377 points and the All Jamaican Composite Index declined by 214 points. Overall market activity resulted from trading in 115 stocks of which 49 advanced, 47 declined and 19 traded firm. Stocks advanced for 138 Student Living Jamaica Limited, Access Financial Services Limited and AMG Packaging and Paper Company Limited. Stocks declined for Barita Investments Limited, Berger Pays Jamaica Limited and Caribbean Cement Company Limited. Trading firm were 138 Student Living Jamaica Limited Variable Preference, Derrimon Trading Company Limited, and Epley 7.50% Preference Shares due 2024. The overall volume leaders were Trans Jamaican Highway Limited with over 4 million units, Wigton Wind Farm Limited Ordinary Shares with over 2 million units, and Sagicor Select Funds Limited Financial with over 1 million units. In regional stocks, in Trinidad and Tobago, zero securities traded. On the Barbados Stock Exchange, Goddard Enterprises Limited was the volume leader with over 2,000 shares. They were followed by First Caribbean International Bank, which traded over 1,000 shares. In regional business, in Trinidad and Tobago, headline inflation decelerated due to slow growth in food and core inflation, according to the Central Bank's monetary policy for May 2023. It said retail price pressures continued to decelerate in 2023, with inflation in April recorded at 6% year-on-year after peaking at 8.7% in December 2022. The central bank added that food inflation slowed over February, March and April 2023 as bread and cereals, vegetables and fruit prices eased. It noted that core inflation decelerated to 4.8%. The central bank said the cooling effects on inflation from monetary policy tightening by key central banks are anticipated to become more apparent in 2023. It predicts that tighter monetary conditions are likely to remain in 2023 as the priority continues to be arresting the rising cost of living in many countries. The central bank noted that despite monetary policy tightening cycles in 2022, inflation is anticipated to decelerate slower than initially expected. It said the IMF forecasts a gradual downward trend in global inflation, falling from 8.7% in 2022 to 7% in 2023. In international business, Kenya signed an economic partnership agreement with the European Union that will guarantee duty-free access for its farm produce to its biggest export market. Kenya on Monday signed an economic partnership agreement with the European Union. The deal, which needs to be ratified by the parliaments of both sides, will guarantee duty-free access for Kenya's farm produce into its biggest export market. Africa's seventh largest economy is a major exporter of tea, coffee, flowers, fruits and vegetables. The EU accounts for 21% of its overall exports. Kenya had signed an initial trade deal with the EU in 2016, alongside its partners in the East African Community Trade Bloc. However, most other EAC members did not sign, meaning it never fully came into effect. 
Officials at a signing ceremony in Nairobi said the agreement will also see tariffs reduced over a 25-year period for European goods entering Kenya. After seven months of negotiations, officials from both sides added that it was one of the fastest deals ever struck by the EU. Kenya is also negotiating a trade and investment deal with the United States, which its trade minister said he expects to be signed next year. In market data for oil, oil prices eased as questions over China's economy outweighed OPEC plus output cuts. Brent crude futures fell 17 cents to $76.44 a barrel, while West Texas Intermediate Crude lost 27 cents to $71.51. And that was the business report on PBCJ. I'm Danita Rodney. Thanks, Danita. In regional news, Barbados' Prime Minister Mia Motley is in support of the creation of a global coalition for social justice. She signaled her commitment before the World of Work Summit 2023, Social Justice for All, hosted by the ILO in Geneva, Switzerland. There's a deep recognition that to make this world a better place, there is no one topic or no one organization or no one leader who can allow it to happen. To make our world a better, fairer place, we need a coalition of the willing to work together each and every day. We need many hands to make light work. We need to share the burden and share the bounty. And we need to treat each other as we would want to be treated. The proliferation of cybersecurity attacks Fake news, food insecurity and water insecurity, war, disease, and of course the state of our planet's biodiversity and its climate. Each of these in their own right could be considered existential threats, unregulated artificial intelligence. And when we tally all of these, we now begin to understand why the world is feeling so much on edge. Antigua and Barbuda is leading the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union in economic growth as recovery is driven by tourism and construction. The country's economy is expected to return to pre-pandemic levels much quicker than the IMF projects. The revelation was made by Eastern Caribbean Central Bank Governor Timothy Antwine. Garfield Burford reports. The currency union last year grew by about 9%. This year we expect it will grow around 5%. In the case of Antigua and Barbuda, we're projecting a growth of around 9% here in Antigua and Barbuda. And in fact, for the next two years, 2023 and 2024, we project that Antigua and Barbuda will go faster than the rest of the currency union, on average, uh, because of a strong, very strong rebound in tourism, and also very uh, robust construction, both in the public and private sectors. The growth has been turbocharged by a robust recovery in tourism and a continued strong activity in construction. The central bank head also explains why Antigua and Barbuda is at the avant-garde of the tourism recovery. I think, you know, the infrastructure that you have here, the tourism infrastructure that is, and also, of course, the appeal, the appeal of Antigua and Barbuda is serving you well. Governor Antoine also says Antigua and Barbuda's economy could return to pre-pandemic levels much sooner than even the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, projects. The fund was indicating that Antigua and Barbuda will recover in 2024-25 back to pre-pandemic levels. Our numbers suggest that you could do that as early as the end of this year. So there has been a very strong rebound in tourism. There is clearly pent-up demand. And, um, and frankly spoken, we would be even better off were it for, not for the challenges with regional connectivity. Because we can't underestimate how important that is for, for our tourism. So impressive growth in the Twin Island state. I asked the governor how that stacks up against the other countries and the territories of the currency union. But in terms of growth performance on average, Antigua and Barbuda is, 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 is growing faster than the average. Mm. 
what I'm trying to get at, in, 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 apart from the average, is there any other, is Antigua the fastest growing, the fastest recovering in the currency union? Based on the numbers that we're seeing, yes. Antigua and Barbuda's economy, based on nominal GDP at $5 billion, places it just behind St. Lucia in terms of size of economic output. The governor also takes the pulse of the country's banking and financial sector. The banking sector here has come back very strongly, is robust, is sound, is stable, and obviously is growing. And the growth obviously has to do with the banks, the acquisitions, ECAB of Scotia, ACB of RBC, and of course, other, other perhaps developments. But this is principally those two acquisitions. He also mentioned challenges, including inflation, which tracks the rate in the region's biggest trading partner, the United States. Inflation has moderated in the U.S., but still remains a challenge. As the European Union continues to partner with Guyana in protecting the country's forests and sea deficiencies, it has indicated an interest in helping Guyana study its vast biodiversity, be it plant or animal species or other organisms. I know, Mr. President, you attach a lot of importance to studying biodiversity and also having expertise here in Guyana on biodiversity. We would very much like to elaborate that with you and see what we can do together to make that happen as well. That we are also an important destination in terms of con the, uh, the continuing the academic work, the research, and supporting uh, such, such work in the whole ecosystem surrounding uh, the biodiversity, forests, climate change, and ensuring that uh, we build stronger system based on uh, facts and based on the, uh, the, an understanding of the true nature of the environment. And further afield, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken held a candid, substantive and constructive talks with Chinese Foreign Minister Xin Gang in Beijing, the State of Department said. Sunday's talks marked the start of the highest level trip by U.S. official to China in nearly five years as the rival superpowers aim to stabilize strained relations. More from Al Jazeera. The U.S. Secretary of State on what he says is a mission to open lines of communication between Washington and Beijing. Antony Blinken met Foreign Minister Qin Gang for talks and a working dinner on Sunday. The highest ranking U.S. official to visit in five years, Blinken's trip follows concerns that mounting tensions between the two sides could spiral into conflict. In recent weeks, Washington has accused the People's Liberation Army of unsafe maneuvers by military jets and warships in the South China Sea. China cut military communications with the U.S. after former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan in August. China considers the self-ruled island Chinese territory and opposes any official contact between Washington and Taipei. The Chinese are also protesting U.S. sanctions imposed on Defense Minister Li Shangfu following the purchase of Russian weapons in 2018. Another point of contention, restrictions on Chinese technology companies due to security and human rights concerns. Concerns Beijing has dismissed as attempts to contain Chinese progress and economic growth. The problem from the Chinese side is that they see these words as not being fully backed up with actions, right? So on the one hand, you've got these kind of positive signals from the president and a number of senior officials. On the other hand, uh, the U.S. still appears to be kind of marshalling its allies to, to, to stymie China, to cut it off from key technology. In turn, China has tightened its own national security, launching investigations into several U.S. consultancy firms and banning sales of the U.S. chip company Micron. Blinken's visit was initially planned for February, but postponed after the shooting down of a suspected Chinese spy balloon. Expectations are low for any breakthrough, though analysts say some dialogue is better than none. Despite deep distrust on both sides, it's hoped Blinken's visit will pave the way for more high-level meetings and a meeting between President Xi Jinping and Joe Biden later this year. They last met in November on the sidelines of the G20 summit in Indonesia. But before another is planned, Beijing will look for assurances that Washington is committed to putting relations back on track, as the Chinese describe it, and respecting what they say are China's core interests. Katrina Yu, Al Jazeera, Beijing. Legal experts are calling for stricter international regulation of digital currencies as British detectives are alarmed by rising cryptocurrency fraud, which is costing hundreds of millions of dollars in Britain.
It was meant to make investing easy and safe, replacing fallible humans with the infallible logic of computer code. But the vast industry, widely seen as the financial wild west, faces many of the same flaws as the system it was meant to replace, without many of the protections. A lot of legitimate crypto traders, of which there are some, uh, are not happy that it's, it's relatively unregulated or mostly unregulated. They would prefer a system that, um, that held people to account, held firms to account when, when they did something wrong. The means and methods vary, but include online criminals posing as organisations offering legitimate services, often impersonating well-known companies. Other scammers offer effortless ways to acquire Bitcoin, that's the first and one of the most popular virtual currencies through social media. Cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin are largely unregulated in the United Kingdom, allowing the fraudsters to net massive profits. According to the City of London Police's Action Fraud Centre, last year cryptocurrency scams went up by 40%, amounting to $370 million for the first time. That's roughly the same as the annual economic output of Denmark. The global crypto industry is still reeling from one of the biggest alleged financial frauds in history, involving the now bankrupt trading platform FTX. Its CEO, Sam Bankman Fried, will stand trial in New York in October, accused of defrauding investors, customers, and lenders of more than $8 billion. Among the G7 group of advanced economies, only Japan fully regulates cryptocurrencies. While the European Union's regulation is set to come into effect in 2024. Last week, US regulators sued the crypto exchange Binance, the largest platform in the world, and its rival Coinbase, accusing both firms of selling unregistered securities, the first of many possible moves against the industry. A lot of these companies are startups, they uh, exist in jurisdictions where the regulations are relatively relaxed. I think with a lot of the, the crypto firms out there, the legitimate ones, um, the, the aim will be build customer base first, controls to follow, and then you've just got a lot of nefarious players out there that actually are illegitimate in the first place, and all they really want to do is take people's money. Is the get-rich-quick, no-strings-attached appeal of cryptocurrency trading that's underpinned its success, and there are fears regulation could stifle the market. But as the number of investors, large and small, continues to grow, the more fighting fraud, scams and mismanagement matters. Neve Barker, Al Jazeera, London. In sports, Minister of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sport, Olivia Grange, says the Finance Ministry has directed her ministry to proceed to develop detailed designs for the proposed works on the redevelopment of the Independence Park Complex. The sports minister says the redevelopment of the Independence Park complex, which houses the National Stadium, has been a strategic focus for her. Minister Grange says the ministry has been directed to proceed to develop detailed designs for the proposed works. We have also been directed to coordinate the planning of the National Stadium development with the activities of the National Water Commission and the National Work Agency among other requirements because there will be further development and widening of the this, this, this streets in the area. Noting that the project is long in coming, Minister Granger says it takes time to do things right. In addition to upgraded stands, seating, lighting and other upgrades, the redevelopment of the National Stadium will include a new velodrome because what the intention is is to take out the obsolete velodrome that's there, to take out all the seats in the stadium, to relocate the velodrome in lands adjacent to the stadium itself, and build a new velodrome there. And then the stadium itself, all the stadium will be semi-covered. Semi They'll be covering over the seats she says they have set a timeline of 12 months to report back to the Public Investment Management Committee with all that is required to take the project to the next stage of the approval process. And that's the news on PBCJ. I'm Simone Absalom-Gale. Pleasant viewing.